Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. A wondrous spirit is rising in this place. It is, of course, the spirit of gratitude. And that spirit, could it speak, would thank God for this wholesale miracle of regeneration that has befallen us with Alcoholics Anonymous. And then the spirit of gratitude would look about and see seated here our friends, friends of science, of medicine, of religion, our friends of the press, and without this group especially, AA could never have been what it is. To them, our gratitude goes out. Someone once said, fittingly enough, that Alcoholics Anonymous is like a farmer's three-legged milk stool. And we might suppose one leg to be medicine, another religion, and the third our own experience in drinking and in recovery. And were we to take out one of those pegs, it would fall down immediately. So our debt of gratitude to the friends who have seen us along is beyond words. Then was nearly everyone in this audience who has suffered alcoholism, there is some particular person who has stood by, be it father, mother, wife, sweetheart, employer, Somebody who stayed on to the end and saw us out of the cave into the light. And it seems only fitting that as a token of all of these, I introduce to you the first symbol of them, my wife, Lois Wilson. Will she stand up? Where are you, Lois? And for Lois and me, we can find no words to express our gratitude for what we have seen and heard and felt out here in this great, warm-hearted state. AA for this state had its inception here in Des Moines. And there has been no place in all of our movement, which now comprises 70,000 members, 28, uh, 2,500 groups spread all over the world in 28 countries. In all these places, there has been no greater, no more rapid, no more successful, no more joyous achievement than right here in this area. While all AA groups at long last become pretty much alike, there always remains a subtle distinction, and at the very beginning of them, they are apt to be very different. And this group bears the impress of the man who spread the message first in this town and then took it all over the state. So to him and those who immediately followed him, Lois and I and all of the rest of the movement, would like to pay tribute. And though we're not much for praise in AA, 
I think it's only fitting that we give thanks to Ray and his early men. Since we have so many friends here today, it seems only me that we might present to you a series of ideas which could convey to you an inside view of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Harry Hammerson Fosdick, speaking of us, once said, Alcoholism is to be likened to Gothic cathedral windows. It is, they are best seen from the inside. So I would like to tell you, as best I can, First, what kind of people are apt to become alcoholics? The medics say that one out of 20 people who drink very much are going to get this deadly affliction. So what sort of people are they who are likely to become alcoholics? And then perhaps you would like to see what the drinking experience is like. And then you would like to know what our recovery is like what our life together in this movement is like. And perhaps you would like me to try to lift the veil of the future a little, that we can see further along. You know, the doctors have a saying about drunks. They say drunks are of the oral type. Of course, by that they refer to the mouth, and they refer to the fact that drunks are always taking in liquor by the mouth, and giving out talk. They love to talk about themselves. And I am no exception to that. So I will try to hang these ideas onto the thread of my own personal narrative. Perhaps a good beginning point would be one winter night some years ago when another AA and I were asked to go to the New York Academy of Medicine, there to hear a report made by learned psychiatrists upon a group of us alcoholics, some 30 in number. And they had investigated this particular group with only one object in mind, not to find uh, how different drunks are, but to find, if possible, how much alike they were. Were there any common denominators? which express the kind of personalities that fall into this dilemma. And my friend Bert and I sat there and heard the discussion, and finally the chairman of the meeting summed it up this way. Said he, I think it is the sense of this gathering from these investigations that alcoholics do differ from normal people. At that point, my friend Bert turned to me and he said, what the hell do they mean, normal? <laughs> but he said, uh, these reports very clearly show that the alcoholic is more childish, emotionally speaking. He is more sensitive. And then he has another quality that we might call grandiosity. That all or nothing quality. That uh, quality, as my friend remarked to me, that I suppose they mean by that the idea that drunks hitch their wagons to the moon and then fall out of the damn wagon. So said the learned men, drunks are childish, they are sensitive, and they were, are grandiose. Oh, yes, they found out one other thing about us, very disappointing to Bert and me, particularly as we had been among the objects of this investigation. We were really desolated when the doctors brought in a report that drunks are not one bit smarter than anybody else. That was hard to take. (laughs) 
Well, going home from the academy that night, my thoughts turned in on myself in a way they had never quite done before. And these words of the doctors began to ring in my ears. Childish, sensitive, grandiose. Are you, were you like that, little Wilson? And then the scene went back to my childhood in a small Vermont town where my grandfather was bringing me up. And my first reaction was that terrible sense of shame. When, as a kid of ten in that little town, I heard the neighbors talking about the divorce of my father and mother. I asked, I thought, any child is cut by such an, an eventuality, but I think I felt that deeper than most. And the neighbors of that time used to say, uh, why, that boy has a tremendous persistence. He, he can get anything he sets his cap on. And my grandfather, liking to encourage that quality of persistence in me, was always proposing impossible tasks. One day he comes in and he said, uh, Will, uh, I've been reading a book on Australia. It says in there that uh, nobody but an Australian has ever made and thrown a boomerang. And then I recalled how my hackles had risen. And how I said, well, I will make and throw a boomerang. Yes, sir, I would be the first, the very first white man to make and throw a boomerang, age 10. So I start in, out in the old shop, way into the night with the lantern, whittling boomerang. All day and all night I whittle boomerang. No school work, no play, nothing but boomerang. Oh, you say that's just a childish whimsy. My kid acts like that. But in my case, it went on for months. Months and months. Nothing but boomerang. And finally, I called the old gentleman out in the churchyard, for I had made the successful one by cutting the headboard out of my bed to get just the right piece of wood. <laughs> and I threw it around that churchyard and it came back and nearly cut Grandpappy's head off. <laughs> and instantly, my interest in boomerangs had collapsed. You see, it was more than normal ambition. There was an inferiority there, perhaps and a terrible, fierce desire to compensate. And that condition began to dog me. I'm in boarding school. First day on the playing field, a boy throws a ball. It hits me in the head, knocks me down. I'm not hurt physically, but I can still remember my anger and humiliation as I looked up at that leering group of kids and they laughed at me. And I sprung up and said, I'll be captain of your ball team. And there was another great laugh. And then I'm off on another power drive, the doctor called, to be captain of that ball team. And nothing else matters. I have a crooked arm here now, something like a ring bone on a horse, the elbow, caused by throwing rocks at telephone poles to perfect my aim to be pitcher of that team. And so I was. See, I was seemingly succeeding. Oh, yes, I had no interest in music at all. Grandfather comes down one day with Uncle Clarence's fiddle and in his provocative way said, well, when Uncle Clarence was your age, he could play this wonderfully, along with the Jews' harp and the harmonic. As much as this, but he said, I don't think you've got any ear for music. Oh. Immediately, I'm off on that tangent, this time to be the leader of the high school orchestra. And in three years, I was, although it was an awful bad orchestra. 
Now, you see, during this period, I seem to be succeeding. You may not yet distinguish between uh, normal ambition and the prideful obstinacy of a power drive, which was really the motivation. You see, as a kid, I was awkward and homely, just like I am now, except then I cared very much. Now it doesn't matter. But then comes a very revealing episode. I'd had a terrible uh, inferiority about the gals. Kids do at that age, but I guess mine was worse. Moreover, none of them paid any attention to me, and that rather proved the point. Until, finally, the minister's daughter took me up. I say took me up because that's the way women do it, you know. So now I'm deliriously happy. Why? In the high school orchestra, I'm captain of the ball team. I'm a president of the class. Now we succeed in romance. What more could a kid want? Of course, I was ecstatically happy. And everybody said, that boy is going to go far. No one could guess how far down. Now comes the clue. One morning, the principal came in the chapel and with a very grave face, he said, I do not know how to tell you that Bertha B. died last night. That was a bombshell, which shattered me so that I was no good for several years. I had what folks then called in Vermont an old-fashioned nervous breakdown. Depression, hysteria, what had happened? This time, I couldn't win. Death was the victim. And I couldn't take it. So, like the neurotic I was, I retreated into the crisis. And I'm not revived from it until, if you will permit me the intimacy, Lois came along and took me in hand. Now then, do you begin to see that maybe those doctors had something? Wasn't I more childish than the average child? What kid would have had a three-year breakdown under those circumstances? No, not the normal kid. Oh, there would have been tears and sadness, and in six months he'd had another girl, and maybe three. Now, that's the difference. Childish, sensitive, grandiose. All or nothing. Inferiority at the bottom, trying to compensate on the surface. That's the picture of thousands of us. We're not all just alike, but it's something like that. That is the kind of personality structure that is so perilous when it begins to use alcohol to adapt itself to life. Well, the First World War burst upon us. Lois and I are married. We face the overseas ordeal. I'm a young officer at New Bedford. A cotton town, very hot and warm. We young officers were in demand. The society folk in the town took us up. And again came that terrible feeling of awkwardness, that inability to say two or three words in such a company. For here were sophisticated people such as I had only read of in books. 
And here were butlers and knives and forks to drop and rugs to stumble on. And I did all those things. Oh, I felt very much out of place. Again, childish and oversensitive, you see. Until somebody hands me a drink. It was a Bronx cocktail, and boy, it was a good one. I took it. Oh, how vividly I can remember that first drink. And then there was another and another. And behold, I have a completely new experience in life. That strange barrier that had stood between me and even those closest seemed to go right down. People drew near to me, and I drew near to them. I was a part of life at last. Ah, what an experience. What an easy thousand. See, I was pouring liquor into a personality structure, and that was the beginning. Well, it was a wonderful beginning. You know, I sometimes suspect that all drunks are innately religious people, and you know the effect of liquor upon us is is to give us far more release than the normal person gets from his drink. So you might say, with much reason, that a drunk is a guy mistakenly trying to drink his religion, trying to get release out of a bottle. And the war comes and goes, and I find myself back in New York, faced with the situation all the vets are today. And again, in the great city, I feel much out of place. And I suspect that uh, the relatives are criticizing me and saying, well, where did Lois get that country bumpkin out the cracker barrel in front of that store in East Dorothy, Vermont? And again, that old fierce desire to win came back. And I said, I'll show these people. And then followed a kind of a Horatio Alger episode. Much to the disgust of everybody, Lois and I retired to a poor part of town. She continued to work. I continued to work. And Yankee-like, I commenced to look around for bargains. And we began to buy a few shares of this and that. I went to law school nights, fiercely determined to show people. Well, how in those Days of wonderful nonsense, the 1920s, did one show one? Why, of course, he got rich. So I had set out to get rich, even as one day I had made a boomerang with just about the same drive. And that led me into Wall Street. And soon, do most little luck, I had much too mon- much money for a kid of my age. The money as such didn't mean much in itself. The money, well, chips in a game, a game for power. Yes, I might soon be on this board of directors or that board of directors, and people could say, there you go. Again, childish, sensitive, grandiose indeed. And the drive for success was on. And temporarily it seemed to come. And during this period, I drank more than ever. Some of you non-alcoholics say, well, why does he have to drink now? Ah, because when you drank, you could dream. And there could be dreams of power and great achievement. And loud talk and boasting would be made easier. And that uncomfortable feeling of not quite belonging could be abolished. 
For down underneath, I was still the sensitive child. Well, then comes the crash. The house of cards falls down. It's all swept away in a fortnight. I remember then, for I had every appearance of being a terrific egotist, I remember then pointing with scorn at those who were jumping out the towers of high finance as suicide. What? Shut up. I have done this once. Why not again? But now the drinking caught up with me inexorably. I began to be very much out of control. In fact, I was likely to be out of control since the first day I drank. But now much worse. Terrific hangovers. Lois had seen for several years there was a serious problem. I had refused to face it. In a dim way, of course, I knew there was a problem. I knew somehow I differed from other people the way I handled liquor. But it gets much worse, much worse. My business friends won't have me back. I become a hanger-on at brokerage shop. And then the decline into the abyss would start. And that was reached in 1932. For it was at that point that I fell over the last precipice, almost to my death. And in that period, there's a little story which is very revealing. Some of you people may ask, uh, why do these drunks, who are intelligent and God knows willful and obstinate enough, continue to drink in the face of certain destruction for themselves, their families, their careers? Otherwise, smart enough, why do they do it? Why can't they stop? Particularly when they want to. Well, this story will illustrate. After a long drift into the trough of the Depression in 32, I had been unable to make any connection when one day I was sitting in a brokerage shop. Lois had worked in the department store supporting the great provider. And I fell into a conversation with a man who proved to be an heir to a great fortune. And I began my sales talk on how, talk, uh, how cheap securities were, how a syndicate ought to be performed to uh, get, uh, put together to gather these things up. And he fell in with the idea. And he brought in other friends of wealth. And the syndicate was formed. And I was to be the manager. Moreover, I was to have a third interest. Well, by the time we got that far in the conversations, they discovered about my drinking. Well, they all drank rather hard. But you could see they were frightened. So they came to me and they said, Look, Bill, uh, we know you've got a real liquor problem. But we think now, under these circumstances, surely you won't have to drink. Wouldn't you be willing during the life of this thing, which may run on several years, to sign an agreement as a part of your contract that you will not drink, that if you do drink, even one drink during the life of this syndicate, your interest in it will be ended? You know, the curious thing is, I really believe that I could stay sober when the incentive was so great. And I did stay sober for a while, and the work began. Money came in. We began to buy securities absolutely on the bottom of that market. And I was very happy, and Lois was coming out of that damn department store. And I could dream greater dreams than ever. Ah, this time I would make it in a great way. So there was no reason to do it. But now see what happened. One day, some old business acquaintances called me up. They said, Bill, we hear you're sober. Is that right? I said, yes, sir. I'm on the water wagon for a long time, probably for life. They said, well, won't you go over in Jersey and do a piece of work for us? You've got time. Party of engineers going out to look over a property. 
Won't you join them and uh, make a report from your viewpoint? I said, sure. The following week, I'm in Jersey. We go down and inspect the property. That evening, we put up at a small hotel, and one of the boys brings out a jug. I said, well, what you got there? Why, they say that, they said that's Applejack, uh, Jersey Lightning. So, won't you have some, Bill? No, no thanks. No, I'm not drinking. I, I, I can't handle it. They fall to playing cards. Every now and then the jug comes my way. With ease, I say, no thanks. Because I can see my name on that contract. And I was inordinately proud of my name on a contract. I can see Lois in that store. I can see my career stretching out in front of me. I can see these things very clearly. So quite easily, I say no. Until about 10.30, perhaps. And sometime between 10.30 and 11 o'clock, something occurred within me. And if that could be ever fully explained, we would completely comprehend the mystery of this obsession of drinking. I remember that about 10.30, I began to be restless. I got rather bored with my friends who were getting a little high. My mind began to drift back over the past. I remember that wonderful day in Bordeaux when the armistice was signed and there were to be no more wars. Oh, the champagne we drank then. And then a devastating thought crossed my mind. Why, Bill Wilson, in all your drinking, in Europe and Spain, never in all your life have you had any Applejack. Not one single drink of Jersey Light. <laughs> and that idea began to take hold and possess me, so that, believe it or not, dear non-alcoholic friends, when that jug was passed to me, a curtain had fallen between me and reality. I no longer saw Lois in the department store or my career or my name on a contract. That was gone, and in its place was the curiosity about Jersey Lightning. So I said, thanks very much. I will have one little shot this time. It couldn't hurt me at all. That is not the, <laughs> that is the insanity of things. The alcoholics here can well picture what happened, and it did. I lay in that hotel drunk for three days, almost insensible on Jersey Lightning. Finally, the telephone rang. It's my new business friend on the wire, and he said, I'm sorry, Bill. It's all over. That, I submit, is not the habit of drinking. That is the obsession of drinking. That obsession that has condemned people like us. Time out of mind. To insanity and death. Well, after that experience, Lois and I knew that we simply had to deal with this problem above all else. Then became the long <laughs> series of hospitalization, escapes to the country. No. And finally, two years later, there was a scene so familiar to many in this audience. Lois was sitting in a doctor's office. I was lying upstairs in his hospital. It was the summer of 1934. She was saying to him, Doctor, why can't Bill stop? He's always been a fellow of tremendous willpower. But it doesn't seem to work on this. Desperately, he's wanted to stop for two years and more. We have tried everything, Doctor. 
tell me. Why can't he stop? Well, as you might suspect, this good man, and he was a good man, explained to her that I was a person whose habit of drinking had become an obsession. That I had been one, he thought might have been among those rare cases that could be re-educated. But that it was now too late, he thought. And he explained to her gently that I had an obsession that condemned me to drink against my will. And that meant, sooner or later, insanity or worse. And he told her then that I would have to be locked up somewhere if I were expected to live very long. Well, upstairs, I too knew what the sentence was. I had learned a great deal about this malady from my own experience and from this particular doctor. And for the first time, I knew absolute and utter hopelessness. I knew that I had no personal power to go on. The grandiosity is now gone. I'm just a sensitive child crying in the dark. Leaving there, fear kept me sober for a while. By dint of greatest vigilance, I kept away from liquor several months. And then again, one of these fatal rationalizations. And I'm drinking again. Some of you say, well, some of these people have reason to drink. There is sickness, ill fortune, ill health. No, when drinking gets so fatal as that, there is no good excuse for that. Anyhow, I'm off again, and it's Armistice Day, 1934. And by now I had learned to drink at home, so the police wouldn't pick me up in the street. And one day the phone rang, and an old friend is on the wire. And I'd known him for an alcoholic. Some years before I had pronounced him hopeless. And here he was in New York, apparently sober. Oh, I said, Abby, come right over. We'll talk about school days. We'll talk about the good old times. And I visioned drinking with him again. Very significant, I said, the good old times. You see, I couldn't face the present, and there was no future. So I wanted to talk with my friend Ebby about the good old days. Ah, that time we hired the plane to fly from Albany up to East Dorset, Vermont, to be the very first to land in that place in a plane. The vestiges of grandiosity, I guess. And how we landed there, and Ebby and I couldn't get out of the plane, and finally fell flat on our faces in front of the village band and the welcoming committee. Yes, we talk about the good old days. And presently he's at the door, and I see him there, and instantly realize that he was more than sober. There was something else about it. He comes to the kitchen table. I push a big crock of liquor at him. Have a drink, Abby? No, thanks. But I'm not drinking. Oh, come, I said, Abby, you on the water wagon? No, he said, I wouldn't call it that. I'm just not drinking. Oh, come now, what's got into you? Tell me about it. So he looked steadily and smilingly at me and said, my friend, Abby, uh, I've got religion. <laughs> he may as well have hit me in the face with a wet mop. Got religion. Oh, dear. He had substituted religious insanity for alcoholic insanity. Oh. 
Well, of course, I had to be polite, so I said to my friend, well, what kind of religion you got, Abby? Uh, oh, he said, I don't think you'd exactly call it religion. I, in my turn, had a good friend, and he talked some sense into me. And this was the gist of it. I got sold on the idea of becoming honest with myself as I had never been before. I got sold on the notion that having made this inventory, I would confide it in confidence to another person and so stop this accursed business of living alone. We drunk snow all too well. And then I was given the idea of taking stock of all my twisted relationships and setting them right, making amends. And then I was taught about a new kind of giving, a giving with no gimme to it, a giving of myself to others without any demand for reward. And my friend was a religious man, and he suggested that I pray to whatever God I knew or could conceive of, if only as an expert. So, said my friend Ebby, when I did these things a few months ago, I got sober. I heard about you. I thought I'd come over and see you and tell you what happened to me. Well, I was thunderstruck. Of course, I'd always have been a pretty honest guy, but I might get more honest. Yes, there were lots of twisted relationships to straighten up. Maybe I could do that without confessing other people's sins. It would be humiliating, but I could do that. Being helpful to other people, why, I'd been the most generous fellow in the world, but I might do even better. Yes, that part of the program was all right, but this God business. Oh, how I did gag on the God business. Now, you see, my friend didn't try to evangelize or reform me. He just told me that story. And that story is really the AA of today. Just as simple as that. Was there anything new about it? No. The only new thing to me, though, was this. That those simple recommendations were made by an alcoholic who himself was released, as he said, from his drinking. And I suppose because it was another alcoholic, what he said struck me deep, as I had never been touched before. Well, without trying to reform me, he goes off, leaves me to think it over, very prudently. I go on drinking a couple weeks more, but I could not get this conversation out of my mind. And yet I kept rebelling, rebelling. I couldn't take this God business. I had one of these dandy modern educations that declares humankind self-sufficient. Some vague God. Oh, I couldn't take that. Until one morning, I said suddenly to myself, after all, who are beggars to be choosers? If I had a cancer, I would become utterly dependent on any physician who could stop the growth of those cells. And then I reflected, well, after all, am I not a man who has a cancer of the emotions, just as fatal in the end as the physical cancer, just takes them longer to die? Yes, Bill Wilson, you have got a cancer of the emotion, and maybe of the soul. Perhaps you'd better try this. So I start for my friend, the doctor, and on the way to his hospital, I got awful drunk. You see, drunks always do that on the way to be cured. And I remember appearing there, and the good man comes down the stairs. Oh, he had been my friend. 
and his face fell as he saw me. I was one of the few he thought who could be salvaged. Here I was once more. And I was waving a bottle and crying, Ah, Doc, this time I got something. He said, My boy, I'm afraid you have. You'd better get upstairs and go to bed. Two days later, I wasn't in bad shape. I had gone to the hospital early, a month before delirium tremens would have ordinarily caught me. And again, my friend stands in the door and looks at me and smiles and said, I heard you were up here. I thought I'd come up to see you. And I thought straightway, well, this fellow practices what he preaches. And then, you know, we dropped a kind of paranoid suspicious. Oh, yes, I said, I suppose this is where he's going to turn on the sweetness in life. This is the day he's going to try to evangelize me. Better look out. Well, theologians in this audience will know that Abby was very full of Christian prudence. He tried to do no such thing. He waited until I asked him again. Abby, tell me again the terms on which you get this. And quite simply, he repeated the formula. You get honest with yourself. You sit down and tell everything to another person in confidence. You sweep away the debris of the past. And make restitution. Be helpful to other people. And pray as best you can. And that was his simple message. And then he went away. And when he was gone, I fell into a depression such as I had never had. I fancied that the last vestiges of my prideful obstinacy were crushed out. So that at length I said to myself, Now, Bill Wilson, now you are prepared to do anything to be released from this obsession. And then, with no particular hope or faith, I cried out as a child in the dark, If there is a God, will he show himself? And then fell upon me one of those tremendous spiritual experiences. It seemed that that room lit up in a great glare, I was transported into an ecstasy, completely indescribable. It seemed in my mind's eye that I stood on the top of a mountain and a great clean wind was blowing, not of air but of spirit, and I was free. At length, of course, I realize I'm still on the bed. But I am in a different world. A great peace has settled down. God seems present and real. My first thought was, Oh, so this is the God of the creature. Well, for me, that was the beginning. I don't know how long I laid in that state. Our feeling that everything was completely all right, that indeed now I was a part of life at last, that I had touched the ultimate reality of a loving God. But after a while, my modern education got work on me, and Something began to say, look out, Bill, you've gone nuts. Yeah. Better call the doctor. My gracious, you had one of these emotional uh, conversion experiences. Must be hysteria. Let's have the doctor in here. So then came my friend, the doctor. And at that point, he proved himself not only a good physician, but a very great human being. For instead of ridiculing this experience, he said at length, 
Bill, he said these experiences are a little out of my line. I do then know that they do occur, that sometimes they cure the drinking problem, that they remotivate people. I have never seen one before. Yes, I do really think something has happened to you. I can't put my finger on it, but your face, your manner, there's something different about you. So, whatever it is, my boy, you'd better hang on to it. It's so much better than what had you only a brief hour ago. Well, I remember lying there and pondering this experience. And then it occurred to me, why, how simply this all came. I didn't even have any faith or belief in advance of it. The essence was complete hopelessness. A friend comes to see me with simple precepts. Somehow those had struck me deep. And when I admit my complete defeat and cry out in the dark, Suddenly, this miracle of relief. That's all there was to it. And utter simplicity. Set in the midst of a great mystery. The grace of God. And then I thought, well, how simple it should be to take this message to other alcoholics. Maybe one alcoholic talking to another can do this trick. And I felt a kind of a divine appointment and began to work feverishly on alcoholics. And nothing whatever happened for six months, even though, with my usual grandiosity, I had set up to dry all, set out to dry up all the drugs in the world. Very large order there. But nothing happened for six long months. And my relatives began to say, when is this guy Bill going to quit being a missionary and go to work? And about that time, I fell into another business deal, which took me out to the city of Akron. And it was one of these proxy rows. I expected to get control of a little company and settle down in that town. And the deal fell through, and I was defeated. And my new associate departed and left me alone in the Mayflower Hotel in Akron without a cent. Ten dollars, maybe. The day following this debacle, I'm walking up and down in that hotel thinking, what to do? At one end of the lobby is a bar room. I began to look in there. People were gathering. A buzz was rising. I thought to myself, well, I might go in and buy a bottle of ginger ale and scrape an acquaintance. It's so lonely here. Ah, you see, the beginning of one of those fatal rationalizations. But now I'm restored to sanity. I say, "Uh uh-oh, that won't do. Look out, Bill, you're going to get drunk. And then I realize I'm all alone. What shall I do? Oh, I must find another alcoholic and work with him. And walking to the other end of the lobby, I saw there a church directory. And I ran my finger down its list of pastors and stopped at the name of one because it was a little odd, the Reverend Tunk. And I said, well, I'll call up Tunk to see if he knows any drunks I can work on. So I called the good man and announced to him that I was a drunk from New York looking for drunks to work on. And he was rather flabbergasted. You could see that he visioned one drunk from New York would be bad, but a flat tune working would be... But nevertheless, he gave me a list of people, formerly belonging to the Oxford group there in Akron, who might possibly put me in touch with the case. And there was a list of ten, and I began to call these people. And it was a Saturday afternoon, and they were all going somewhere else. They would see me in church Sunday. And my heart fell as I went down through the ninth night. And the last name on the list was a name very famous in the tire business. And it was the name of a woman. And I said, well, 
And that person would certainly not want to see me on a Saturday afternoon looking for junk to work on. No, I can't call that one up. And then I thought, well, maybe it's better. Ah, on what slender threads are destinies sometimes hung? I make the call. A lovely southern voice comes back to me over the wire. I explained to her. She said, yes, I'm not an alcoholic, but I think I understand. I had an experience after a great humiliation one time. Once you come straight out here, I think I know to a man in this town you should meet. So I'm at this great estate, and she welcomes me and said, there's a doctor here in town that has been trying desperately for years to get over alcoholism. I think you can help him. He's almost lost his post at the city hospital. His wife is a semi-invalid. Their house is about to be foreclosed. It's the story you know so well. Shall I call up to Smith? Oh, I said, please do. So she goes to the phone and calls the Smith. Ann Smith comes on the wire, and my new friend Henrietta said, Ann, there's a man here from New York who I think could help Bob. And she explained to Ann. Well, Ann said, that's very interesting, but you know it's Mother's Day, and Dr. Bob is a sentimental old cut, and he has brought home a great big potted plant, which he has placed on the table. But I must confess that he himself is so potted that he's on the floor, and he can't get up. Well, Henrietta said, maybe you could get him here tomorrow. And then turning to me brightly, she said, won't you be up here tomorrow? Oh, boy, would I be there. And on the morrow, there came walking through Henrietta's door, Dr. Bob and Ann, more founders of AA. Well, they didn't look much like founders then. Bob was frightfully shaky, said he could only stay a minute. That meant, folks, that he was thirsty. Henrietta discreetly put us in an off room. We began to talk. Ah, this time I had quit the preacher. This time I needed that man as desperately as he needed me. And this time something passed between us. And AA really began right then and there. For you see, the friend who had brought me, the colonel of this message, fell by the wayside. Something passed between Dr. Bob and me right there, I think. But one wouldn't know it. I explained to him. He said, it sounds interesting. Ann Smith said, well, won't you come over to the house and stay a week or two, Bill? He wanted me to kind of look after Bob, you know. Arrived there, Bob said, hadn't we better be working on some alcoholics? Well, I said, I guess we shall have to if we're going to stay alive. said, fine, I'll call up the city hospital. They're all the time coming in down there. So he called the city hospital, got the nurse in the receiving ward, explained that he and another guy from New York thought they had a cure for alcoholism. I noticed that he flushed deeply right after that. I suppose the nurse said to him, well, why don't you try it on yourself? <laughs> but friend nurse went on to say, we just got a dandy case in here, or... He used to be on the city council, well-known lawyer, gone all to pieces, been in here six times in the last four months, can't even walk from here home without getting drunk. Awful nice guy, but he's just beaten up one of the nurses. He's got black eyes, he's got him strapped down. How will that one do you? <laughs> so Dr. Bob said, fine, put him in a private room and we'll be down tomorrow. Well, on tomorrow, Dr. Bob and I saw a sight which tens of thousands of us AAs have since seen. It was the sight of the man on the bed who doesn't yet know that he can get well. So we walk into this chap's room. We tell him the story. He shakes his head. He said, no, he said, I'm sorry, but I don't think this is for me. He said, it's too tough. 
He said, I don't even dare get up and go out of here. I'll be drunk on the way home. Yes, you fellas know you're drinking onions, all right, but no, it's not for me. And besides, don't talk to me about religion. I was a deacon in the church once myself. Well, we came on tomorrow, and as we looked in the door, we saw his wife sitting at the head of the bed, and she was looking at her husband, saying, Why, Bill, or his name was Bill, too. Why, Bill, what has come over you? You look so different. You act so different. And he turned to us, and he said, Yes, he said, There they are. These fellows have been through this thing. They understand. They brought me some ideas yesterday. I didn't take too much stock in it. But during the night, I got thinking. And during the night, some hope came. And I thought, maybe if they can do this thing, so can I. And then during the night, something else came to me. And I became willing to do what they suggested. You know, I think I'm going to be all right. Give me my clothes. I want to get up and get out of here. And so spoke AA member number three. And he did get up and he got out of there and he went into a fracas, a political battle for his seat on the city council. And his opponents reviled him and said, what? Vote for this Dodson, the common drunk? And he was defeated in the political battle. But our friend Bill, AA number three, has not had a drink to this day. So you see, there were then, as the Testament has it, two or three of us gathered together in the city of Akron. And we three worked hard that summer to start a group and got one or two more. And that was the beginning of the first group. And now that I have discovered that I needed the alcoholic as much as he needed me, with that more taste and attitude, I went back to New York and another group started there. And the one in Akron began to get people coming to meetings in Cleveland. And the New York group spread to Philadelphia and to Washington. And so our slow growth began, those pioneering years in which we couldn't yet be sure, but during which we grew, oh, in three years' time to perhaps 40 members. And then we began to say, well, we've just got to put this experience in some kind of book form. And the upshot of it was that we ourselves prepared a book. Thirty of us contributed stories. I helped to write a text for it. And that book, put out in the fourth year of this thing, was called Alcoholics Anonymous. And with the advent of that book, the clergymen and the doctors and the publicists rallied around us and began to say, this thing is good. Liberty Magazine published a piece. Mr. John D. Rockefeller gave us a dinner, but happily, little or no money. Saturday Post printed a piece about it. And then an avalanche of inquiries began to come into our little office in New York. And we began to correspond with these people. And we began to keep track of our traveling members. And so AA began this phenomenal growth. So that now I can bring greetings and congratulations to 28 countries, 2,500 groups, 70 to 80,000 members. And I can say to you that our program is being presented perhaps to 10,000 new cases a month somewhere in the world. That 2,000 of these are recovering almost immediately. And past experience suggests that of the remainder, three quarters will one day be with us. Ah, yes, our cup really runs over. So now this thing born in so much adversity has now come to be called what the world calls the great success. And in AA, 
we are beginning to be aware a little bit of success in any worldly sense. We find it necessary to keep reminding ourselves that this is not our success, that this is God's success. And in these past ten years, we have had a marvelous experience of trying to live and work together. And out of those experiences, we have been trying to sense the best attitude for us to take one to the other, group to group, our movement to the world outside. And how shall we relate ourselves to these troublesome problems of money, personal property, authority, and so on? So Alcoholics Anonymous is now developing a tradition which we hope will keep this movement in a state of indissoluble unity for law for so long as God shall need it. And the elements of the tradition well, they too, like our recovery program, are rather paradoxical. For example, we cannot keep any alcoholic away from us. Any alcoholic may become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous on his face, though. We can't charge him fees or dues. He's a member if he says he is. In earlier years, we thought this movement would take great amounts of money, maybe plants, hospitals, or whatnot. Now we have become utterly sure that this movement should remain poor, however well to do our individual members. After all, we don't need money, for this is a personal message carried from one to the other, just requiring a place to sit down, or maybe a little club a meeting hall, a gathering of this sort once in a while. There just aren't any expenses. Yet materially, we have profited immensely. I think the total earning power of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous in the next 12 months will be at least a quarter of a billion of dollars. And yet our central office down at New York requires perhaps a dollar a year a member to carry on. And he doesn't have to pay that. It's all voluntary. I myself am not paid to come here as a missionary. I receive a royalty as an author on that book. We are amateur from top to bottom. There is no profession. In our public relations, we have taken a paradoxical gift. We say, let our friends recommend. Let, let us not blow our horns from the public level. Let's be anonymous at the public level. Let's place principles before personnel. So that gives you a little glimpse of the structural side of AA. How to tell you non-alcoholics, though, who have not been close to us, of the spirit of this thing, well, that is beyond my passion. This joyous life together, this knowing other human beings as we have not known even our best friends. This living under the grace of God. Then, of course, we ponder our future. We think there ought to be no succession to the founding. We think in the middle of this movement we should leave nothing but a center of service. Perhaps a newspaper, an information office, a board of trustees to handle our few funds, Surrounded by a conscience. As simple as that. So then you see AA has its 12 points of recovery, an amplification of those simple ideas that I set out to you, which would seek to unify the individual, 
It has 12 points of tradition, which would seek to make the movement whole and unified, and one with the world out from. And then we would like to set in its middle just a simple committee. No big names. We'd like to abolish the word founder for each of us is a founder for a new life for the next lifetime. Yes, in moments of imaginative reflection, Alcoholics Anonymous seems to me like a great cathedral in the building. A cathedral, if you will, of truthful principles. And one can see written on its great floor where 70,000 of us now stand in peace and security are 12 points of recovery. And now the 12 points of tradition might represent the side walls which are going up, which we hope will always contain us in unity. And the center might be likened to a spark. And may the symbolic finger of that fire always point straight upward for God. Thank you, Bill, for that inspiring message. The message that you heard, um, I watched you very carefully. And you should have heard a pin drop during all the time the bill spoke. It's been a great privilege for us to have Bill and Lois here. We're thankful. I want you to know that we've had some inquiry about when we're going to pick up the ticket. We, we forgot it this year, but next year we're going to take them up. to know that your presence here today has thrilled all of us, and be the good Lord willing, October the 29th, 1949, we hope you'll all come back. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.